So I'd just like to give a little bit of background about how I know Eric and, and why um, I'm privileged uh, to be here and how Eric was nominated. So it's an interesting story as well. Um, <coughs> back in uh, the early 2000s, we had a program in the School of Leadership Studies that was, uh, was called the JPSL program, Justice and Public Safety Leadership. And the JPSL program uh, had a lot of paramilitary folks that were involved. And at that time, uh, we were partnering with uh, JI, the Justice Institute of BC over in Vancouver. And one of the fellows uh, happened to be, uh, at the time, Staff Sergeant Thomas Karik. And Tom is Eric's deputy. Now, something else that's really interesting is in 2010-3, so this would have been the summer cohort, this is when I first came to, to meet Eric, and Eric came into the cohort with two, have two additional colleagues from his organization. So there are actually seven people that are either grads or current students, uh, both in the MA in Leadership and uh, Peace and Conflict, I understand as well. That's correct. And so there's a really unique opportunity within that organization to bring the values of leadership and learning uh, uh, alive. So um, came to know Eric in that particular summer, and you all know what Res 1 was like uh, for those who are in the MA in leadership. And so at that particular time, there was a three-week cohort. And so there would be a little chatter every now and then where Eric was talking about, I wonder how this applies to me back at work. And I wonder how the rest of my organization would absorb all this sort of learning in a policing structure. So you can imagine those types of conversations. Then um, I, I came to know the organization a little bit more. And I, I said this at lunch today that one of the things that surprised me was I was on my way out to uh, uh, another colleague from Eric's cohort. We were volunteering our time to do what's called a future search conference, and some of you may know about that. Uh, but on the, on the way in, in the car, I actually was listening to a CBC radio show, and on the radio was a woman from, uh, from York Region who was talking about how difficult it was and with issues of domestic violence and sometimes police didn't always understand the cultural nuances associated with that. And that the, the issue of cultural diversity is significant to, to Eric's region. But what, really, what happened next really surprised me. And it was the woman naming Eric and thanking him publicly as Anna Maria Tremonti interviewed him about the sensitivity to violence in, in ethnically diverse uh, communities. Uh, so so that, that was one thing. Then the other was, at the point of gathering his data for his OLP, Organizational Leadership Project, um, because of the relationship, uh, Eric's relationship to the community, Eric was looking at uh, uh, in engagement strategies for policing in an ethnically diverse community. And in that uh, process, Eric couldn't be there to gather his own data. So you can imagine what that was. Uh, it created both a challenge and an opportunity. And I think the opportunity was all mine. <laughs> so uh, on, on behalf of Eric, I, I facilitated a session where with 100 and some odd folks in the room. And what was striking was they each began uh, telling their, their, how they could, um, from their perspective, how they would like to see poli uh, York Region Police engage that community. But they began it by saying, and I'd really like to acknowledge and thank uh, Chief Jalif and his staff for the policing jo the job they've done in the community. So to hear a very sensitive group in the sense that not always um, respecting or uh, in seeing police as engaging and sometimes more fearful of police or distrusting of police was really heartwarming. Uh, fast forward to just recently and I received a call from uh, Thomas Karik from 2005 saying, hey, we'd like to nominate the chief. And supporting the nomination is a colleague who is in the program, classmate uh, Brian Bigra. And so together with Beth Page, who's also a faculty here at, at the School of Leadership, uh, we supported Eric's nomination. So it's with that in mind that I'm really thrilled that Eric's here today. So please join me in welcoming Eric today. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, I should let you know that, that Eric and I just recent, briefly gone over a few questions. And so what we'll do is we'll just have a bit of a chat and see where the conversation goes. And uh, after the end of that, we have a microphone right over here. And because we're streaming on the internet, if you have a question of Eric, uh, by all means, please come on up to the microphone over here and we'll make sure that the both uh, present and online were able to hear the question. So I just wanted to start with something you and I were talking about. Uh, tell us what it's like to be the chief of police. Well, first of all, I think I need to comment on the photograph that you've used up here. Uh, that's two years ago and I didn't have gray hair in that, if you'll notice, I, I now have some gray hair. But um, <laughs> the, uh, the role of a chief of police is uh, very significant in a community, as you can imagine, the fact that uh, the ability to uh, help people live in safe and healthy communities is, 
is uh, dear to all chiefs of police and uh, the goal to ensure that people are safe and secure every day is top of mind for, for a police chief and certainly top of mind for myself. It's, uh, it's a, in, in some respects, it's a bit of a daunting task. Uh, my days are usually about 18 hours long. I start very early in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, and usually pack it in about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Uh, we joked, uh, Phil and I joked about uh, how does one get an OLP or how does one uh, complete a master's degree with a uh, work schedule like that, but you know, it happens. And you, as we, uh, uh, as you probably have already discussed, trust the process, right? It'll unfold for you and it will happen and, uh, and uh, it did for me and I know it will happen for you also. So uh, being a chief is, uh, is uh, been a lifelong opportunity that I, I look forward to doing and, uh, and wanting to give back to my community. So you're 33 years in yes. policing yeah, and so you started out in Edmonton Yes, I did. Care to one of those. <laughs> I did one of those. Uh, I grew up in uh, uh, a community called Thornhill, which is uh, in York Region, just north of t the city of Toronto. Uh, I went to uh, public school and high school in that area, and started uh, a degree at York University. Did two years at York University, and one of those uh, aspirations of wanting to be in the policing profession and wanting to give back to my community, and I did one of those go west young man experiences. So I found myself in the city of Edmonton in 1979 when the city of Edmonton was booming in its own right and uh, worked there for three years and then moved back to the region in 1981. Okay, so uh, I was, I was um, saying a little bit earlier that uh, I don't often carry notes around with me but there was a whole bunch of stuff I couldn't remember. And that was, uh, one of the things that's quite impressive is that you, you have a long history of, of learning in terms of engaging in formalized learning programs. I just want to read a few of the opportunities here. Uh, er Eric has a, a BA, honors degree from York University. He's a graduate of the FBI National Ac Academy, lead program in the United States of Department of Justice in Quantico. The School of Ma uh, Rotman School of Management Leadership Police Program, the Police Executive Research Forum Management Institute, and, and it goes on and on and on. So if you, if you can think back to <coughs> maybe 2009, 2010, early, uh, having had a number of these experiences, what inspired you and what were you thinking? What was going, not, not only, what were you thinking? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Yeah, what was well, I what thinking? thinking? Right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, was, uh, what was your thought process um, that led you to search out a program? Why leadership and why Royal, Ro Royal Roads? You know, uh, a changing time within our organization. Uh, uh, an opportunity uh, was beginning to present itself. The fact that uh, there was going to be the top leadership position within the organization coming available. And uh, being one who thinks that uh, lifelong learning is a per an important goal for one to achieve and I uh, I did some significant research around where I might do a leadership program and found myself uh, enamored by the program here at Royal Roads. It's a very unique program in my opinion and uh, uh, having you know and most of you have done the university circuit and sitting in a class with uh, three or four hundred people that uh, uh, this is has been a completely different experience for me the online learning piece, I figured, oh, maybe I'll be able to hide a little bit, but no, you can't. <laughs> you <know? laughs> uh, very engaging, right? The program is a very engaging program uh, designed for those for folks that are, that are in the working world. And uh, it just, this one just seemed to fit very nicely uh, with my lifestyle and uh, turned out to be a great opportunity. So the blended model in, in particular was, was attractive that, to you? That's correct, yeah. yeah. So with, with that in mind, uh, r the program is uh, very unique that way, a blend of face-to-face -face and, and, and distance. And uh, the program often begins with a pre-residence online period and then <coughs> straight into residence. And uh, residence one can be an interesting and uh, unique time. So, uh, <laughs> apparently. And so, <laughs> when, when, you have, when you left residence one, I, I'm going to just curious, I mean, I'd like mm -hmm. to hear a little bit more about your experience in res, but I'm thinking when you went back, when you went back to work and you have your, your executive command team and your colleagues and, uh, and those who you know back at work, what did you say about what it was like to engage in that type of learning at Royal Roads? Um, 
was put in some interesting uh, scenarios when I was here. Uh, as Phil has indicated, I was with uh, two of my uh, compatriots from the police service uh, and uh, having to do some very interesting exercises. I'm, I'm sure <laughs> some of you have done those exercises where you sort of have to come out of yourself, right, and uh, declare a few things. I had to be a flower one day, and <laughs> I know that, uh, I know that uh, when our group, the, the leader of the group for the morning said that uh, you can be whatever you wish to be, and I'm looking around and I see these two other officers from my police service uh, in the group and saying, oh my goodness, how can I possibly do this? But you know what? I went ahead and, and did it, and uh, I got some interesting feedback from uh, <laughs> <laughs> some interesting feedback from uh, from from uh, the two officers that were with me. The fact that uh, they saw me as a different person, right? They saw me uh, uh, just as themselves, and uh, the rank was left at the door, and we were here to learn together uh, as a cohort. So uh, that was a, a unique experience. But having uh, having okay. done Resonance One and uh, learning about self. Um, and uh, learning about my values uh, started to formulate some some very significant uh, opinions of where I might take a police service if I ever had the opportunity to do that. So at that particular time, you weren't in the in the police chief's role, and it was about six months later that that position opened up. Yeah. Somewhere. So I started the program here um, in April of uh, 2010. And in December uh, of 2010, I was appointed chief of police. So uh, through that uh, through that transitional period, uh, I started to look at my organization. Uh, I started to look at the learning and think about the learning that uh, had been shared with me. And uh, I thought maybe I might have an opportunity to make a difference in my police service by applying some of the learning that is taught here. So in that sense then, so when you went back and, and the opportunity opened up, um, how did you see the connection between <coughs> your leadership learning here, what you're experiencing online, and what you saw as the challenge coming up ahead in terms of a, an executive command position? And in that sense, what, what was your immediate priority, if you will, in terms of so leadership? So perhaps I can just share my thought process here. And um, in, uh, in uh, November of 2010, the um, posting came available for uh, the position of Chief of Police in New York Region and um, having spent almost six months in the leadership program, beginning to think about my organization, uh, thinking about the membership in the organization and some of the uh, programming here and in particular uh, the whole values-based uh, learning uh, that was imparted upon me and I started to look at the organization wondering how I might be able to uh, reshape it and um, I had an opportunity to be interviewed by a, a governing body and that's when I started to introduce to them all about the vision mission and values of a police service and the importance of values and living those values because I strongly believe that if you live your values those show so uh, leading a uh, my employer through a thought process uh, which uh, s is supported on two pillars for me and that's the pillars are our people and our community and uh, I know that if uh, if you live your values they'll show our police service was living the value of community in a large way and I figured well if we can live it in one of the values why can't we live it in the six others so from that point on I was uh, and I have been messaging the importance of living your values every day. Mm -hmm. So to, to think back then in terms of your, your, your broad overall experience, so year one, year two, right through your research and your data gathering and, and graduating earlier this year, um, what stands out for you about perhaps the defining moment or a, re a memorable a moment um, about your entire journey for your MA? Um, I can tell you, uh, Probably, uh, I was faced with a, with a um, significant challenge in uh, June of 2011 uh, where uh, it became a significantly defining moment for me as a leader in an organization. 
on uh, June 28, 2011, uh, a very young fellow, 32-year-old gentleman with two very tiny children uh, was killed in the line of duty. And uh, for me, it was, uh, uh, I had explained earlier today about uh, people expect the chief of police to be strong and stoic and uh, it was a significant defining moment of the fact that I felt I needed to tell it the way I saw it and how I felt from my heart. And uh, I did that and uh, I could see significant change in an organization in terms of seeing a chief of police in a very different light. Someone who uh, leads from the heart and that's how I lead my organization is from the heart. Mm -hmm. And, and it, from what you were able to see, what, what were the reactions to your colleagues and staff as a result of your approach to leadership in that moment? So perhaps I can put a little further context for you, Phil. Um, having to step forward for the organization and uh, say our piece publicly, uh, having to address uh, Garrett's Platoon mates was a challenge, to say the least. But um, later that afternoon on the 28th, uh, I had to address the media. And as I was approaching the podium to talk about Garrett's life and the importance in, that he made and the difference he made in our community, I had heard a little whisper from uh, a member of the media saying that um, we have a beauty and uh, I've been in the business, as Phil has said, for 33 years. And usually when the media have a beauty, they phone you about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, on a Friday afternoon, for your comment. Uh, I had left the podium to go to my office when to find that uh, they had played uh, Garrett's last words, his last dying words, uh, nationally. So as a chief of police, um, for me that was a significant turning point knowing that I had to stand up for the members of the police service and set the record straight. I had been on the job six months when I had to nationally take on uh, the media and I can tell you our media, we have a significant partnership with our media. The importance of police and media relations is huge but it was also important to ensure that uh, I was able to set the record straight for not only Garrett and not only his family, but other victims across this country. So I had done that and uh, that was a significantly defining moment within our police service um, and a staff that appreciated the fact that a chief of police would stand up and, and set the record straight. So you, for, from what I'm hearing you saying, you, you speak a lot about the personal courage it takes to do that as a leader, looking inwards and then d deciding at that moment. Sometimes perhaps our body betraying us, saying you're doing this whether you like to do it or not, and out you go. And you've also mentioned the value of people w within York Regional Police as well. Um, what sort of priority did you give that when you came into the role as the chief in December in terms of looking at the list of values and, and where you were? And, how you would put your particular stamp on your mm -hmm. approach to leadership? So uh, as I uh, took over the organization, we had six values. And uh, I had done a significant amount of research around uh, our organization's business plan. And in 2010, our organization had completed a significant organizational survey about what the members of our police service were looking for. And I happened to notice that uh, they were looking for uh, empowerment and leadership and supervision and ownership and accountability and those sorts of things. And I got to wondering, why are they asking for this? And then I went back to the values of the organization and I noticed and realized that the value of our people was missing. And you all know, all organizations are driven by the people within it. And I can tell you, I am so fortunate to be the chief of police of an organization that is filled with outstanding people. And uh, for me, that was important. I, I had uh, listened to our command staff and, 
Uh, a defining, another defining moment for me was when we were talking about a very senior member of our organization and no one seemed to want to take ownership for that individual and I thought to myself, how does an organization create this? And it came to re my realization that we're missing this so important thing about valuing our people. So we inserted the seventh value of the organization of our people. And so in, in what ways does that show up as a value in York Regional Police? You know, it's all about uh, listening to people, and valuing their input. I spend a lot of time uh, within our organization talking to people. And uh, I have lots of opportunity to do that through training sessions. All our police officers are required and mandated by provincial legislation to go through what we call a requalification period of time. So uh, they'll spend a week with us in training. So we have 2,100 members in our organization. It's a large police service. And uh, every week we have a training session going on. So I'm able to uh, get into those training sessions and talk about what's important uh, to our community, uh, what's important to the members of the organization, and uh, in part, continually impart the importance of, guess it, vision, mission, and values. And I do that for all our police officer staff, and I do that for all our civilian staff. We have 500 civilian members in the organization, and it's equally important to spend time with the members of the police service, getting to know who their leader is, but also getting to understand where the organization needs to go. So you've, you've also spent a fair amount of time uh, influencing your superintendent and c uh, staff sergeants um, and trying to do that both in a, in a learning oriented way as well as in a, such a fashion that they be held accountable for their choices uh, around um, directing their own learning in particular as an opportunity for advancement. Um, you chose to circulate a book uh, to a wide audience in your organization. No surprise, it's a Kuzis and Posner book. <laughs> And in fact, you chose uh, The Truth About Leadership that talks about the 10 commitments mm -hmm. to the five practices of leadership. Why are you so drawn to Kuzis and Posner in particular? I don't know, for some reason that book, uh, The Leadership Challenge, uh, struck a significant chord with me. Um, maybe because it uh, you know, talks about authenticity and, and uh, leading from the heart and things that sort of were deep for me. And, um, um, it significantly resonated for me when I was in Residence One. Uh, I do lead as best I can on those five principles. Uh, I try to model the way every day. I try to inspire a shared vision as best I can. Um, and always challenging the status quo to make York Region a better place, to make our police service a better place. So. Uh, that book for some leadership challenge for me was was a huge eye-opener something I hadn't really experienced or had read about previously to my time here at Royal Roads and uh, after reading that one I happened to fall upon uh, the 10 truths of leadership uh, and that really summed it up pretty nice so uh, for me uh, as I go through our organization and for people to understand where I come from and I tell them uh, if you if you have a look at this, you might get a fuller understanding where I what I stand for and where I come from. And w it, was that met with any cynicism at all, or was it uh, warmly? Well, I think you know, <laughs> uh, when you make change or try to uh, lead some change in an organization, there's always uh, you know that cynicism. There's uh, uh, always a little bit of organizational resistance going on, and I can tell you that um, my first month on the job. Uh, this is the leading from the heart piece. Um, I had asked that we make a amendment in the, uh, the allocation of our supervisory staff so that when, they, when our young people finished working on the street, a supervisor would come off the, st off the street with them, which was new for our organization. And um, it was all about living the value of our people. And the best way to do that is be with your people. So I had launched that and uh, I have a command, a senior, senior command of 11 superintendents. And um, it's interesting because we are in the midst of learning all about organizational resistance here at Royal Roads. And as I launched that and listened to 
uh, the dialogue around the conversation about implementing that into the organization. We had one meeting that lasted about an hour. And then we revisited it for a second meeting for over an hour. And then it realized that, woo, I must be missing something here because I'm starting to identify organizational resistance. So we went after it a third time. And uh, we had a huge conversation around the importance of being with your people. And um, having to understand uh, our organizational culture pre my tenure as chief, uh, most decisions were made in the chief's office. So I had committed to the command staff that I would engage them in the dialogue and the discussion about making change in the organization. So uh, we had the, quite a fruitful conversation and one of my command staff said to me, um, I can't agree with this. And I said, it's, it's good, we'll talk about this some more. But after we came to the conclusion that we would make this supervisory amendment, um, it dawned on me that uh, what I was watching was actual organizational change in its smallest level and the fact that the individual that couldn't uh, move forward with it, uh, that individual realized that when we left the room, it was no longer the chief's decision, this is what we're going to do, this was a collective decision. So no longer in, in our business, when things uh, maybe aren't going well or, or they're not liking the decision that's made, they usually point their finger to the third floor or wherever the corporate head office is and say, because the chief said so. So for me, this was a defining moment because they had to leave the meeting and say, not he said so, but we said so. A huge defining moment for me. Okay. So I, I'm wondering if the two are related here. I'm curious. <coughs> so after, if you think about your shift, <coughs> excuse me, from um, the deputy responsible for administration, and you had a, a large management experience and lots of learning opportunity, both specifically to your profession as well as to the management of community-based services and so on and so forth. When you were promoted, with what was your first priority in terms of leadership, this, that shift from management to leadership? Not to say that your deputy position didn't have a, a significant element of leadership, but now you're looking at leadership of an organization itself, you're not, not, not solely within it, but of it. So I'm curious, what was your big priority in terms of... Uh, so part the was, there are actually two pieces of the priority, if I may. Uh, one is chain you. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I'm the chief, he says. Uh, <laughs> Uh, two, two, uh, two things that I wanted to do for our organization was change uh, the culture of a community and change the culture of a police service. And uh, that was based on a significant amount of work done here at Royal Roads working on my um, leadership project. Uh, in my second residence here, I um, formulated that I thought it was really important that uh, our regional police service started to engage uh, and enhance our relationships with our visible minority communities. And perhaps I can just put a little context mm -hmm. to that. York Region, if uh, any of you know York Region, um, currently it's 1.1 million people. And of that, 54% of our community uh, are, are immigrants. And I happened to be talking to uh, the chairman of the region of York, who was the head political mm -hmm. figure, and he had shared uh, a little piece of information with, to me that York Region in 2030 will have 1.5 million people in it. So we see 25,000 new people every year moving into our region. But in 2030, York Region will be 63% based on Im immigrant population. So three quarters of a community will not have been born in Canada. So then one needs to look at the dynamics of that and the dynamics connected to the police service. So, so on that note, <coughs> what fuels your connection to community? You mentioned a couple of experiences that you had earlier in your career that bring the relevance of your, your research here at Royal Roads into a different sort of light. 
Can you say a little bit about so, that? So uh, a couple, two, uh, that come to mind. Uh, I was the commander uh, of one of our detachments in the city of Markham. Um, very diverse community. And uh, we had uh, an incident that occurred in another community within the region of York um, where there were some accusations that a young black fellow had assaulted one of our court security staff. And so I'm thinking, hmm, you know, that's up there in Newmarket. I'm down here in the city of Markham and minding my own business until uh, I was approached by uh, the Markham African Caribbean Association mm -hmm. uh, demanding answers from the police service. They weren't a asking questions of the chief of police, they were asking the questions of the local commander and I'm thinking, well that happened up there and I'm down here and what does this have to do with me? Um, they had uh, asked to speak to the chief of police of the day and uh, for one reason or other uh, that wasn't unfolding. Uh, and then I became engaged in the whole, whole process and, and then for me it, getting a fuller understanding of the actions of police. There's all uh, this particular community group was looking for was an apology from the police service that they didn't condone that action. That's all they were looking for but it wasn't without having the dialogue. Until I had that dialogue it, I realized that that was the case and I was able to facilitate that for them. Now a more entertaining story most recently, in 2009 I had the opportunity to travel with a couple of my peers to Egypt and South Africa. And uh, I'll share this story, it's a kind of an interesting story. We were going there to uh, do research around youth violence and how were the local police working with the youth and community to combat this particular problem. We found ourselves in Cairo and had the opportunity to uh, interview the ex uh, executive director of uh, the national executive director for women's rights in Egypt. Uh, we introduced ourselves and her immediate reaction was that you're the police. And said, yeah, yes we are, we're from Canada. She said, okay. The only reason why I will talk to you is that CETA, the Canadian Economic Development Fund, funds us. So that was a bit of a, a little tiny bit of an eye opener. Um, I, then I explained to her why we're here and we were looking at youth violence and wanted to know what the police were doing in, in partnership to combat that. And she said, oh, you want to know about the violence of the police on the youth? I said, N no, 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 no. <laughs> so I repeated the question and she says, oh, you want to know about the brutality of the police on the youth? <laughs> so for the next two hours, we heard stories that I just couldn't believe as a Canadian police officer could actually even take place. And you know, we left that interview saying, oh, this person is way over here and they obviously have a dislike for police. The following day, I uh, had the great opportunity to interview the Brigadier General of the Egyptian National Police. This gentleman uh, commands 500,000 police officers. We arrived at the headquarters of the National Police, uh, driven there by an uh, embassy uh, employee. Uh, we were greeted uh, on the steps of their headquarters with, uh, with an interpreter, 40 generals, and the brigadier general. And our dialogue was through all through the interpreter. They took us into uh, the meeting room, which was twice the size of this room, and everything was gold gilded. And listen, not understanding the politics of Egypt in 2009. So we had a great conversation. Everything was done through the interpreter. I'd ask a question, he'd answer the question back and forth. Almost a three hour dialogue. And uh, at the completion of that uh, session, uh, we did our little traditional thing that we do in our business as we shared some gifts from Canada and whatnot. 
And I had said to the Brigadier General, Sir, I have forgotten to ask one very important question. And he kind of nods at me. So we're very much interested in youth violence and its extremes. So we're going to the terrorism side a little bit here. He turns away from me and goes, blah, 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 in Arabic. Basically saying, shut the up to his 40 generals saying, I will answer this question. That was my immediate take on his response to me. He turned to me and said, sir, we have no problem in that area whatsoever in perfect English. <laughs> the three of us, <coughs> my two cohorts, we looked at ourselves and said, I think it's time we got out of Dodge. So we climbed in the embassy van, said to the driver, tell us about the Brigadier General. Oh, Brigadier General so-and-so, Oxford scholar, uh, spent most of his time in London, England. Blah, 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 blah. Experience number two. Experience number three, we were going to a place called uh, Luxor. Anyone know where Luxor is? That's the Valley of the Kings. And we were in the airport, and when you go in the airport in Cairo, all of your luggage goes through an x-ray machine as soon as you go through the door. Then you go to get your tickets. Then you go to the gate. Uh, at the gate, there's another x-ray machine. And my uh, traveling companion had uh, his little handbag with him, which had already been through the x-ray machine. He placed it on the conveyor belt to go through the new x-ray machine, and the police officer manning the machinery moved the bag into the machine, stopped it and moved it back and forth a couple times, and then moved it back and started talking to us in Arabic. And we're both looking at each other. We're not sure what he's saying. The lineup behind us is about 100 people deep, everyone nattering. Uh, lady behind us said, that bag is not going to go with you. So we got into quite a conversation about there's nothing in the bag and so forth and so on. At that time, uh, this police officer took his legalized, legal sized ledger, black ledger book, you've seen them, took it and he slid it down the table. He opened it up and started tapping his finger. So this other police officer and myself, we looked at each other and said, not sure what that's about. <laughs> the lady behind us says, gentlemen, that bag is not going to go with you unless you pay him. So uh, we got into quite a debate. Uh, that's bribing an official. We got into a huge debate. Now the lineup is 150 people deep. <laughs> uh, the lady behind us put a 25 pound Egyptian note down. He took the book, he slams the book shut. He slid it down the table and went like this. Three days, day one, day two, day three. What I got from that is the police are brutal, corrupt, and extensions of the government. So we fast forward to 2011, 2012, and I share with you, York Region is a community, will be a community in 2030, where three quarters of its makeup are folks that were not born in Canada. So on my mind, I'm thinking to myself, not what do we see when we see come someone coming, it's what do they see when they see the police coming. So I spent all of 2012 doing the research about how York Regional Police can enhance its relationships with its visible minority communities. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have that context. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm aware of the time, and I would like to ask you one, um, well, two questions. One is, you were nominated by, uh, this is one of the ones I don't think you wanted me to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> you were nominated by uh, a past grad, um, a current student, both of whom work for you. Uh, 
supported by Beth Page and myself. What were you thinking? Like, how does how, how does that make you feel? Like, some, in terms of the honor or the expectations of those around you? Well, you know, it, 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 this has become a very significant honor, and um, to be to be nominated by um, peers in my own organization for the things that they see going on, the change that we are trying to make collectively as an organization, um, the ability for uh, our police service to um, not only talk about self and self-improvement, but talk about team and talk about organization, which you've learned about self, team, and organization, which this uh, the leadership program is based on. Uh, for me, for, for them to recognize that and endorse that has, has been Significant. Right. Well, somebody emailed me a question this morning. Somebody who couldn't be here is a colleague of yours from your cohort, 2010-3. And I'm just going to ask, she asked me to ask this question of you. So, Joanne, if you're listening, this one's for you. Um, make sure you ask him about being a block parent in residence. It was true leadership and accident. Action. <laughs> Care to comment? Well, you know... <laughs> Everyone here has been re in residence, right? <laughs> Occasionally you might go out and have a Coke or a Sprite or something like that, right? <laughs> and you might wander back in about one in the morning or something like that. And there are some of us that are senior in age and need our sleep. And uh, so uh, one evening, uh, Joanne, thank you for this question. I really appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of... Uh, Part of the class decided they come in about 2.30 in the morning and uh, wake us seniors up. <laughs> so uh, that was it. I had to become the block parent and ensure that people behave themselves. So uh, I actually enlisted uh, Sandy, if Sandy's happy to watch, I enlisted Sandy to to be the uh, the assistant or deputy block you parent. You deputized her. I, deputized, I did yeah. deputize her too. <laughs> right, so we had a lot of fun. Residency is a pile of fun and you got to have fun. That's why I share at work too, right? Uh, important to do what's important to get done, but you can have fun while you do it at the same mm -hmm. time. Okay, thank you. Okay, folks, at this point, I'm going to uh, open it up. And if you have any questions at all, please, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the microphone, that would be terrific. And we can make sure that someone uh, can be hearing us on the web. And I, I understand that everything's open. <laughs> I share, I, I'll tell you what I share with, uh, I was telling Phil earlier that um, I really think it's important as a leader in an organization to connect with the people within the organization. So I avail myself uh, a ton of time uh, to do that. And uh, I'll talk about what's going on in the organization and what's important to our community. And you know, sometimes you run into a scenario like this where people are a little reluctant to, to, to ask or say, and I usually start my conversation off by saying, uh, usually the first person who sends the Scud missile over the bow begins the entertainment. So I would encourage anyone, if they have something that's burning in your heart, to ask, please, please ask. Um, so my question I, is, I see a lot of my values as a leader, or I can hear a lot of them when you're speaking. And one of the things, even in healthcare, which is where I come from, um, where you think that empathy and personability and all those things would be highly regarded, they aren't always. And have been told on a number of occasions that I'm unlikely to climb the corporate ladder if I continue to be as informal a leader as I am and informal in the way I present myself, I guess. And so when I'm hearing you at the very top of your organization talk about uh, leading from the heart and you know your values in that regard and, and, and caring for your staff, were you met with resistance? Because I don't, I don't think that that's normal for your, what I know about police and that sort of organization. And so if you were met with that resistance, what did you, what were some strategies you used? How did you, how did you, I guess, pave the way so that you could lead the way that you needed to lead? You know, I, uh, this is an ongoing journey. 
Um, lots of uh, improvements still to be done. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Um, I think the healthcare culture may be somewhat similar to the policing culture. Um, see some challenging things day in, day out that sometimes may, may, may jade you. Uh, in my OLP, um, not, only, not only did I look at uh, community engagement, building trust and confidence, but also looking at police culture. And police have a very strong culture. Um, and when I was doing, uh, we were doing a focus group with uh, our command staff, which I had to exclude myself from. Um, but when I looked at the data, one thing that came out uh, clearly, and there's lots of different ways you can analyze the data. Uh, one of the simple ways I analyzed the data out of this particular focus group was doing word simple, simple word counts. And uh, what jumped out for me was this us and them mentality. And uh, listening to Phil had, as he had indicated, had, had, had led um, a open space for me at over 100 uh, community leaders from our visible communities. Um, and they were, they'd asked one, one big thing that pops out of the research was, how come your police officers come out the way they do? Which caused me to look at culture big time and understanding the police culture and you have to understand that when we take a new police officer into the organization we teach them about criminal law and highway traffic act matters and we teach them use of force and use of force and use of force we do that when we bring them into the organization they get that when they go to the police college they get that when they come back to the organization and through my research uh, it became quite clear to me, and it's very strong. The literature around police culture is very, very strong. This whole us and them uh, is, is strong, but I am now starting to change an organization in terms of the way we, we train people because uh, you can imagine the metaphors in our business. So the words like the war on crime and the war on drugs and the stories we tell in the organization lead some of our folks to believe that there's an enemy out there. But the challenge is they don't know who it is. So what they do is they, they start to create a distance between themselves and the community. So part of a leader and part of organizational change is to, is to recognize that, but also talk about that and talk about the importance of community engagement and what that brings to an organization. Now, you heard me talk about communities who see their police, some of the our communities in York Region see their police as brutal, corrupt, and extensions of the government. So you've got uh, communities with their own opinion of policing, and then you've got a police service with its own opinion of what its role is. So the challenge is to bring them together. So we're beginning to work on uh, the teachings around uh, community engagement and the also important building trust and confidence. And they say leadership is all about developing relationships. And that's where we as an organization are going. And, but I can, I, can, uh, I can hear you because uh, I think our professions uh, have similar challenges. Mm -hmm. Kim, I think you had a question about OLP. Standing up really tall. Um, welcome, thank you. Uh, my name's Kim Gunning. We have a, a connection in uh, Jennifer Gunning. 
All right. <laughs> My daughter-in-law works <laughs> with Eric, so yeah. very happy to have you here today. We are on day one of Res 2. Um, and Boom. many of the people in the... <laughs> 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 many of the people in the room are here um, to uh, support you and congratulate you and to lay eyes on somebody who has survived. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very well aware of that. And one of my questions, um, and, and hopefully this will spur others from the group, is as you looked into, you know, you've talked about leadership challenges, and I think as faculty we're always helping and, and urging and poking and prodding and getting people to think about what their leadership stretch is, that their OLP is, is a vehicle for the leadership, um, and it's not the end. So I wonder if you might speak to that journey of using your, um, the, the OLP as a vehicle to um, enmesh in conversation with your community, and, and so now what? Now that you're finished, how is that leadership continuing to evolve and be relevant to you and to your organization? Right, I guess is, that's a great question, you know, and um, uh, that's the, I think the greatest thing uh, that this university can offer you and the organizations uh, that you work for. The ability to do action research within your own organization is significant. So you've heard my project is all about building and enhancing relationships with our visible minority communities. The two other officers that were here with me, one was how can we facilitate uh, an exit strategy for those retiring from the police service. That's also hugely important. And we have the other, the third officers, he is working on his, which is all about selecting uh, training officers for our organization. But the best thing uh, about uh, the OLP is the fact that uh, it's live research with an ending with recommendations. The leadership challenge is implementing the recommendations. So um, I found myself in a very unusual position, the fact that my sponsor uh, was my employer, which is a little bit different for most people. So I report to a board. I have a seven member governing body that I directly, I'm on a personal uh, employment contract with the board. Uh, and uh, I shared with them that this is the project I was going to do uh, they embraced it wholeheartedly, but at the same time, there was expectations that, uh, that I fulfill the obligation <coughs> of uh, the recommendation. So as a go-forward leadership uh, challenge is I have about 17 recommendations that came from my project that I'm beginning to implement in the organization, which for some people uh, within the organization will be uh, a personal stretch. Mm -hmm. Something you, you may not know, um, for those of you in the room, is that when the chair of the region announced to all of the um, open space participants that uh, Eric was pursuing his master's degree in leadership at Royal Roads University, they gave him a standing ovation. It wasn't that, it was a separateness to it. It was the, the, the group felt very positive about being there and contributing. So often when we think that we're alone or when we're doing something to our organization or outside it, really we've got a lot of support. Got a lot of support going on. And I saw that in spades in, yeah. in your, the chair of the region. Others, any questions? Elaine. Oh, Mary. Mary, then Elaine. Okay. Hi, uh, Mary Collins. I'm a member of the board of uh, Royal Roads. And uh, just again, congratulations. Uh, it's wonderful to see you, Eric, and, and the work mm -hmm. you're doing. I'm also involved in policing as the vice chair of the Vancouver Police Board. So I'm certainly aware of the, the cultural issues involved in policing and, and the challenges that, that we face in policing. That's not easy. It's not an easy life. It's great what you're doing in terms of the community engagement piece, and I think that will really be helpful to other police forces across the country. But my question is that leading when times are good is one thing. Leading when times get tough, and whether it's in policing or other parts of the public sector, 
when the resources may not be what you want and where it may lead to service or staff cuts uh, creates a whole different kind of environment. And I'm just wondering what you might be able to say to us of how you would envisage leading if you, I don't know if you are in those circumstances, but if you or when you might be in those kinds of circumstances, how it would change. Well, I, yeah, that's a, that's, that's, that's a tough question. <laughs> and uh, um, I can tell you that uh, policing across this country uh, is wandering into those very difficult times. Um, those who follow what's going on in the province of Ontario will see that uh, financially things are becoming very, very challenging. Uh, and in our profession, uh, we're starting to look at ourselves uh, in a whole new light, that how can we become uh, more efficient and, and uh, more effective uh, with the current funding that we have. But I do message to our board um, the all-important piece, and that's about connecting to community. Uh, and this is a tough conversation to have, because they say, Chief, you can have so much. Um, but just to take you back to my comments about the growth of York Region, 25,000 new people, which doesn't include uh, industrial and commercial growth that we see. And uh, I share with them that uh, in our profession, uh, many things are the same. So crime across the country, we are all trying to battle uh, crime in its own various forms. But in York Region, uh, we have this huge growth. And York Region is a community that is moving from, de uh, moving to intensification or densification. So they're building city centers, the city of Markham, the city of Vaughan. Uh, Markham's getting themselves at 20,000. And you'll have seen the ramifications of a 20,000 seat arena. Um, but we are challenged with a third or a fourth component and that's significant diversity. And you've heard me talk about the significant diversity. And this piece is hugely labor intensive to build relationships in communities. And uh, I hazard to guess uh, if we did not pay attention to communities uh, of significant size that um, find themselves living in geographical, similar geographical area. As a police service, if we are not able to get in and connect, they will close in on themselves. Uh, that's when you get the fail uh, to report crime that's going on and then you wake up the next day and realize, oh my goodness, what has happened? And then you really start to pay the price for repair. So uh, as an organization, uh, I'm having to do some adjustments to, to deal with what you're talking about. So we are looking at significant civilianization. So taking roles that police officers were, were doing and moving civilian staff in to sort of combat the ever increasing cost of our business. Um, but for our community, uh, if I didn't sort of message that, uh, this is taking the leadership stand, quite frankly, if I didn't do that, um, some people five years from now will be saying, I wonder what that chief was thinking about and how could he not move an organization that connected with its community. And that, unfortunately, takes some resources. Mm. Thank you, Mary. Elaine. Elaine, and then we'll go to the internet. So, hi there. I'm actually um, a resident of York Region, so you're my police chief. And it's mm. extremely uh, comforting for me to hear what you're saying about the engagement with the community and, and the work that you're doing. So I guess from two sides, I'm interested to hear how you're going to measure your success. So how will you know how well you've done? And I, I'm interested to hear about that from an OLP perspective and how you did that and also as a, as a community member. 
So um, one of the measures of success perhaps will be how effective we are at recruiting within our diverse communities. So in the last uh, six years or so, uh, we've moved uh, our organization from 6% diverse to 18% diverse. So that is a significant move, uh, knowing that in, uh, in many, many communities, policing is not necessarily seen um, is the highest form of a profession. Um, but, I, but I guess, uh, you know, another measure will be um, just how successful we will be at, at engaging community and um, the full engagement of community, right? If engaging community is not just going out and saying hi and meet and greet, but it's actually allowing your community to have a say in how your business is run. So the ability to have folks uh, inform on policies and procedures, for example. Okay. And we had just done that. We, um, we have been working with our Sikh community um, uh, for them to be able to wear kirpans coming into court. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, in, on in Ontario, that uh, you can't get into a court facility if you have such a thing, you go through metal detectors. And so we just finished working with our Sikh community to allow that cultural tradition to unfold for them. Uh, but we used that community to help us inform the policies of our organization. So I, for me, those are ways, I think, of measuring if you're having some success. But I can tell you, we have a long way to go. We have a very long way to go. Thank you. Thank you. We have one question over here, and then we'll go over to Candy. So this is a question from Angela, who's watching from Toronto. I believe she's a cohort mate of yours. Uh, she asks, you spoke about the impact leadership challenge had on you, as well as the values-based leadership learnings you experienced throughout the program. Has your perspective on the York Regional Police motto, Deeds Speak, evolved or changed as a result? Um, that is, uh, for, for folks who don't know, the motto of, of uh, York Regional Police, uh, is deed speak translated uh, actions speak louder than words and this has been in a tradition in our organization for 40 years or over 40 years and uh, when I conclude uh, most of my uh, community engagement opportunities uh, I end with the words deed speak and um, as an organization I'm so proud as an organization, I'm so proud that the members live that every day. And I can tell you, I get, uh, uh, I allow myself to be um, connected to our community. Anyone in our community can email me anytime they want, and I will directly email them back. And I get a ton of accolades, I mean, a ton <laughs> um, of accolades from our community saying that you folks live up to your model. And it's a very unique model. We get, uh, we get uh, emails from all over uh, North America about that particular model. It really uh, is, uh, really coins quite nicely what we do as a police service day in and day out. Thank you. Andy. Welcome, welcome Chief uh, Jolliffe. We're, I'm also a resident of Ontario. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> As a member of um, the MAL uh, healthcare cohort, where you recognize that we're always learning about systems. And in healthcare, um, looking at what we do in our organization, also you have to look outside in the entire system. So looking at your community is great, and I give you tremendous credit for what you're doing. I wonder though, as a member of a, of a trio, so when we call as a civilian, when we call 911, we get not only the police, but we also get EMS as well as fire. I'm, I have two parts to my question. I'm so impressed with what you're doing in your in York region. My question is, how do you, how are you 
um, assisting the other parts of the system, so the Toronto Police, the other regional um, police forces to do similar and the same so that we learn as a whole system, not just a regional system in a silo, um, but also how are you engaging your learning and your um, engagement with the community with the other services that you often respond with, the EMS and fire? Um, so uh, I've had to fess up the fact that we have some cultural adjustment to make. And, and that cultural adjustment uh, in Ontario begins at the Ontario Police College. So uh, I've had my conversations with the director of the college and come to learn that uh, out of the 12 weeks that a police officer spends there, uh, virtually no time <coughs> is spent on uh, community engagement and or building relationships. So uh, to affect the entire system, uh, that's where I have begun, to create the dialogue there to, uh, to ensure that uh, policing in the province of Ontario uh, looks at what we train our young folks. So I'm doing that on the outside, but on the inside, uh, we're doing the same thing to, to engage uh, our own staff about the importance of community engagement. Now, in terms of your second question, uh, we have some significant partnerships in uh, York Region. I can tell you, York Region uh, population of 1.1 million people. Um, so we compare ourselves with the likes of Montreal, Toronto, Peel Region, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, the greater Vancouver area that is. Uh, York Region is the safest place of Canada in Canada, over a million in population. So that's very significant. And it happens for two reasons. First, it happens because you've got great people in your organization. But secondly, you have built great partnerships in your community because, as you know, you can't go it alone. And um, Phil can attest to the fact that um, we work with our uh, our mental health providers. Um, Phil talked about uh, that little uh, piece he heard on CBC. So we work with the South Asian Social Services Network over domestic violence. So we're con continuously connecting with our partners uh, for the collective goal of a community to create those healthy and work and living environments. So the importance of building partnerships for our police service is huge. Mm -hmm. In uh, just to fill in a, a blank or two here, um, under Eric's sponsorship, a group of colleagues, uh, we donated our time to lead what's called a future search. Um, you'll learn about that methodology shortly if you haven't already. Um, day one, okay, that's day two, <laughs> sorry. Day two. <laughs> <laughs> But what was, interesting, what was interesting in this process, it took six months to plan, and it took two and a half days to deliver. In the first six months, we were identifying who in the community needs to be connected and integrated in order to move this system forward. And the specific focus was youth uh, under the age of 18 who are experiencing mental health crisis. So we had a number of the hospitals involved, community-based agencies, EMS was there, fire was there. What was remarkable in the session, we weren't even at the planning and outcome stage yet, People are making connections saying, we can do this together, we can do this together, we can do this together, around all the different service components. So for example, one real practical thing that we saw happening under York Region Police um, sponsorship, and this comes from Brian Bigra, who had just graduated from the program, working for Eric, was to say, why don't we open up some of our training seats to do joint training with um, uh, EMS. So great, so we're getting s exposure to education and so on. But it didn't stop at the paramilitary structures. You also had Seneca College coming to the table and saying, we'll develop a certificate program so that your folks get credit for doing that. So we see real movement ahead around g engaging not only the agencies that serve institutionally, but then there were also consumers and interest groups and families saying, how can we get involved and what's our role? So I think that's a really good example of how York Region Police is actually stewarding and shepherding, uh, connecting 
I think, in the community. Uh, folks, I think we have time for about one more question, and then uh, we need to keep with our honor for the committing to 6 o'clock. One more question. I am a BC resident, so, <laughs> and <laughs> I do have friends in policing both municipal police forces and working with the RCMP. And when you're addressing cultural issues in your city, do you foresee that there could be a possibility for you to transfer the information and the data you collect on your successes across into our different cultures that are actually indigenous to BC and the difficulties mm. that policing has in breaching into those communities as well? Hmm. You know, I, um, the Canadian Chiefs of Police uh, have just launched some new research about what we need to collect in terms of measuring our successes. And we have relied on the traditional methods of crime rate, um, um, clearances, number of traffic tickets issued. Um, but in their research, uh, they're starting to find that um, this is just a tiny piece of the, of the bigger picture in terms of um, measuring successes. So uh, the health of a community, uh, the wellness of a community is, is not only the responsibility of a police service, but it's the responsibility of other agencies and uh, they have just sort of uh, come into grips with uh, how can we all collectively as a team, so all the service providers that provide a service in community, how can they all come together and measure their bits of the pie that give us a better uh, understanding of uh, our efforts collectively in a community. And so, uh, this is new for, for, for our business in terms of trying to measure um, what, we, what we're doing and what the outcomes are in conjunction with the healthcare industry, for example, or the mental health uh, community, um, the social services community, and collectively as a team coming together, each of us individually collecting new data that supports uh, the work that we're doing in community to show change. Um, this is sort of, uh, in our business anyway, it's at, the, it's at the leading edge because we just measured ourselves on some uh, fairly straightforward metrics. Um, so for the, for the board member from Vancouver, um, mm -hmm. you may hear of this discussion, the fact that um, uh, even uh, Political folks are using the same measures that we measure for, for a police service's success. In actual fact, we may be measuring the wrong things. And the things that we need to measure are, are we making a difference in terms of creating healthy communities? Uh, and what are the long-term uh, ramifications of the efforts that we do? Thank you so much, Eric and Phil. Eric, mm -hmm. you have brought alive your leadership learning and provided us with some, some inspiring and really meaningful, deeply meaningful stories that we can actually apply to our learning, right? So thank you so much for that. Thank Phil, thank you for facilitating a wonderful discussion. It thank really you. was great. Thank you. Um, and thanks to all of you. I know that some of you have had a very long day today and I really appreciate you coming out and asking good questions. And thanks to you online and it was nice to hear Angela online. Um, really great to uh, have your questions as well. Eric will be actually presenting at Convocation tomorrow and you can uh, see it through the live streaming online. And um, Eric, I'm just so proud to have you as an alumnus 
Thank you very much. Thank you.